The short game is listener supported on Patreon. If you'd like to support the show and join us on our Discord, head to theshortgame.net or patreon.com slash the short game. Welcome back to The Short Game. This show about short video games, games that respect your time. I'm Reagan Kelly, and I am joined this week by two excellent co-hosts. Laura Nash. Nate Heininger. And this week we are talking about a Metroidvania again. We are talking about Haiku the Robot, a uh, a, a Metroidvania uh, that came out on Steam earlier this year. I think it was in April. I'll have to double check that. Mm-hmm. April 28th. Thank you, Laura, and uh, and is coming to Switch later, but at this point it is a uh, is exclusive to Steam, uh, and this is one of the games I have, I mean, I've, I've really been wanting to check this out ever since it came out, just looking at some trailers, I was like, I want to play that, and when I, uh, we were looking at a hole in the schedule recently, and I checked how long to beat, and this thing says it was, I believe how, how long to beat says six and a half to ten hours, which, again, how long to be is a little optimistic, but I was excited that this thing might, might be in our show's remit, and um, here we are. I mean, how many times have someone recommended a Metroidvania, and it said 12 hours on how long to beat, and it's secretly like 30,000, because <laughs> more often than not. So when it's actually a short game, um, I'm thrilled. Especially, um, I was super excited with Haiku the Robot because it said it was an exploration game. And I often have heard Metrovania or this kind of, you know, platform exploring, call it like, I've heard them mostly talk about their combat or talk about their, you know, storytelling, maybe. The upgrades. The many, (laughs) many upgrades. Skill trees. Explore every single part of the map 20 times. I'm like, I'm tired of this part of the map, man. Like, calling it exploration is a way to my heart. Yeah, Yeah. this this does have all of those things, but it is, like the best Metroidvania, is really about sort of unlocking a a, a really huge interconnected world piece by piece. Um, The exploration part is the strongest aspect here, for sure. Yeah, I think so. And um, I was super excited to uh, to be able to play this and really put some time into it. Um, you know, spoilers, this is one of my favorite games that we've done on the show in a while. I really, really enjoyed this game. It's also, you know, exactly what I like. A, it's uh, Nate Bay. <laughs> so Nate picked it. I showed uh, Nate a list of like six or eight games that we because he, he missed our last episode. And I said, hey, Nate, here's our list of six potential games to choose from. And uh, on the list was uh, Haiku, a very Hollow Knight inspired Metroidvania, <laughs> six to ten hours. And Nate was like, you don't even need to ask me. Like, you know which one well, of these I'm going to choose. I wanted to do it for a few reasons. Um, you know, one, because all of those buzzwords are exactly what I want. Hollow Knight is one of my favorite games of all time. And so a game that is even trying to be in a similar vein is appealing to me. But also finally get to be what i always want to be which is like reagan i got my steam deck and this just felt like what a what a perfect game to now uh, we can be absolutely insufferable together see it's not insufferable anymore i did not play this on a steam deck i am not one of the these elite gamer (laughs) boys with a steam deck it was insufferable reagan when it was you doing it but now that it's me it's fun and funny um cool i'll party with a hoi polloi (laughs) and cool uh yeah so i got my my steam deck and uh this felt like the perfect sort of game to break it in and uh i played hollow knight on the switch and loved it i was like let's let's do this on the steam deck and uh yeah i loved this game uh i and i i do think that that it's its strongest uh elements is more it's like traversal and exploration um and just sort of like map layout uh and so i'm not surprised that in its press and its own sort of self promotion it's highlighting itself as an exploration game more so than exploration a, platformer which i think is yeah. really cool as a, a pairing and and before we get too deep into it i do want to give a shout out to uh 
this is a solo developer, really. This is Mr. Morris Games, uh, and Jordan Morris did all the animation and code, lead designer, programmer, um, paired with a... Uh, the only thing that he didn't do is a uh, composer, sound designer, which was Guy Jones. So it's pretty impressive. Very impressive. You know, we do a lot of solo dev games on this show because we focus on indie games, you know, and 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 I think that that we've done some pretty remarkable solo games. But uh, I did not know that until we were prepping to record like a half an hour ago, and I would have, you know, I would have believed or thought while I was playing it that this was like a full on development team that was fully funded um, because uh, I mean, this is a very polished, um, very slick game that, uh, you know, I don't think you often see this. It's a short game kind of, um, but like the, the depth and expanse of the game is, is, pretty large and yeah, just looking at right. the map like once you get to unlock enough of it like it's a big it's a big map big map and it has the feel of like a really a big game um yeah i, I know like uh, hollow knight i think was a pretty small team uh not to compare there again too much but it is a good touch point um that game is a little bigger uh, uh quite a bit longer but like like they felt similar scale while i was in it it, it did well it's also it's a similar like it's a lot of tight tunnels and single screens that like really if you know where you're going and you're just straight up avoiding enemies, you can actually probably traverse the whole map in, in a short amount of time. But it is so densely packed with so many entrances and exits and so many um, enemies just sprinkled throughout the entire game that generally speaking traversal is kind of slow and that just makes it feel even bigger than it actually is we haven't done a ton of metroidvanias on this show because so many of them tend to be a little too long for us um and um the ones that we have done tend to be the sort of like almost like mini metroidvanias i think back to things like gato robato where like they tend to be more linear more focused on kind of getting from point A to point B. Yes, there's backtracking and we can argue about what technically constitutes a Metroidvania or if that term is even decent or not another time. But like they're, they tend to be the sort of um, more limited, more compact kind of version of Metroidvanias. This feels sprawling, despite the fact that like theoretically people are completing it in under 10 hours. <laughs> um, I, I should also say right off the bat that I've, I've spent eight hours in this game. I think I'm close-ish to the ending, but I am not at the actual end yet. Uh, Nate, I believe you're on the end boss. I am on the end boss, and mm. I am not as good at keeping track of my time. I just tend to like set games down while they're running, and, and you know, so it's all goofed up. Um, but I, I'm certain I'm in the more like 10 to 13 hour range on this game. Um, and that's definitely a your mileage may vary, may vary sort of thing because um, it's all going to come down to how effective you are at the combat. And I think that the combat in this game is good. It's not the best part of the game, but there were parts that um, I got hung up on just a couple of the bosses that really slowed me down. And I think for some people they would be able to take them out with no problem. And I, I, it wouldn't surprise me if someone could beat this game in under 10 hours, um, but that has not been my experience. Mm -hmm. So we, we've we been dancing around the comparisons because we don't want to spend the whole time comparing this game to what's clearly its number one inspiration, and that's Hollow Knight. But um, in, in case it's not clear, this is a game that is really directly inspired by hollow knight yeah. um it has a lot of the same mechanics and structure um and it has that same feel to me this felt like hollow knight a lot of a lot of the time um, I, I mean if it there's there's enough things in here that are unique and interesting and their own spin that i wouldn't call it a ripoff of hollow knight it is its own entity but it's really close to that i mean it is it it look it plays it looks it feels and tonally it feels pretty similar like this is like hollow knight's like kid brother you know mm -hmm. um i i think the the big difference that i think they're going for here is also what they call out in 
the copy that um, Laura was reading is that to me, Hollow Knight was like the combat was as equally uh, important and like deep as the world building and the exploration and like the bosses you know hollow knight got a lot of comparison to like you know dark souls and stuff like that for how challenging the bosses were the variety of bosses um i know i spent far more time in hollow knight fighting the bosses this game the combat i think it's far looser it's far um uh, a simpler is not the right word, but it, it kind of is just a little bit easier, a little bit simpler. There's a lot less to learn, a lot less like techniques that you have to do. And I think they focused more on exploration and that world building. And I think it's just, it's successful, but like this works for me because Hollow Knight's one of my favorite games and I will take any, like any other version of it, you know, as we all wait for Silk Song, which is referenced in this game. It's intentional. Like this game very much knows what they're doing. I, you know, it's, it is purposeful. There's at least one, if not multiple Hollow Knight references in this game. Yeah, for sure. And it's, um, it does stand on its own in a lot of other ways too. Like it, yeah. it's not, uh, it doesn't look like Hollow Knight to me. Um, it has this very cool, uh, pixel art visual style. I thought it did the, you know, I, you know how, uh, uh, what a purist and a bit of a, um, weirdo I am about pixel art, but this game really nails it. Uh, it has really nice, consistent, beautiful pixel art with really well animated characters, especially the main character who I assume is named Haiku. Um, he looks sort of like a little round Kirby style robot. Uh, he's got a big sword. He's got the kind of like disconnected Rayman limbs that don't seem like they're fully attached <laughs> to his body. And um, uh, but it's all it's all presented in this sort of uh, it's fairly high resolution pixel art, but it's also yeah. kind of low color palette. So most of the beginning of the game um, is pretty much just exclusively these like burnt orange tones, which is a weird color palette to see. Uh, you know, you, you often see things like, oh, you know, it's black and white or it's uh, it's, you know, Game Boy style color palette or it's an NES color palette. Here it's this like extremely limited, like four color or something uh, palette, but it's not a color scheme that you typically see um, in this kind of stuff. And I thought that was really cool. And then it continues as you explore other areas to try other color palettes, too. And it looks really neat the whole time. I thought this game was like has a great visual style, maybe not quite as gorgeous as like some fully hand painted stuff. We've, we've talked, we've played, played deed lit in wonder labyrinth that has extremely beautiful, uh, vibrant pixel art, but this has its own style and it's really, um, it's really cool. Yeah. Like think of the like seventies three piece suit. Like that's the colors of browns and oranges and yellows mm-hmm. that you're seeing. That is not the, not the, uh, not the comparison I would have made, but, um, uh, that, your your uh your like i like theatrical it. background yeah. is showing laura i like your uh your costume reference there well yeah. i'm just thinking like it's it's a 70s color scheme like you it's, think so it's, i guess so i see it i see it brown and orange and yellow and pale yellow is like classic 70s uh what's also classic 70s is um <laughs> nuclear <laughs> apocalypse uh apocalypse content and um you know so i think to set up the game a little bit more. So yeah, you're playing. I I'm also assuming the name is haiku. You're playing Confirmed. as Confirmed. yeah. Um, this little robot who has awakened for whatever reason and found themselves in a world of other robots that have uh, seemingly gone bad. Um, they're, uh the sprite work is great there it's like a uh uh like an oven that is hopping around and f- blasting fire out of its mouth and it it just sort of looks evil or like little screws that are hopping around and um you know tires, uh, tires mm-hmm. and and like dishwashers and you know all these random uh you know mechanical things or your whole smart home home gone bad yeah are are just like existing in this what you know seems to be a built world um but they've all gone bad and 
the main crux of the game is essentially trying to figure out like what happened, uh, why has all of these robots turned bad and could you possibly uh, you know, save them or, or turn things around? And you, they start to sprinkle in. I don't think this is a spoiler. Um, it's pretty early. But they start to sprinkle in that this is clearly a post-human world, mm-hmm. which I think, you know, it's pretty obviously when you see like an oven and a dishwasher hopping around. But still, you're not really sure until, you know, they make it a little bit more clear. It's it's a world that there were humans. Now they're all gone for whatever reason. And now you, Haiku, have to figure out uh, what happened and maybe try to to save them. Um, there's a Wally reference in this game. There's a lot of good references. I ran into that too. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it's kind of a, um, you know, not necessarily like the most uh, groundbreaking premise, um, but I really thought the execution was nice. Like the the um, dabbling of lore and sort of trying to piece together what happened and and make your way around this world and and kind of try to figure out like why does any of this exist in the first place uh was compelling enough for me to like continue to to explore and feel like i was getting something other than the more standard metroidvania where it's just fun to get more powerful like Mm -hmm. this game doesn't really have that at least for me it doesn't have that like power fantasy side of like some metroidvanias where by the end you are this like God who just lays waste to all of the areas that you've been before. Um, It's more about just building up abilities and exploring the world and understanding what happened and maybe why it happened. And is there anything you can do to, to turn it around? So to talk mechanics, there's two big areas that I think this game does really, really well. One is its exploration and specifically how it handles its map. And then secondly, we can talk about the, the, like the powers and upgrades and everything, but I really want to talk about the map in this game. Um, because the thing that I think that they do really, really well is knowing when not to show you the map. Um, the best feeling in a game like this is that uncertain feeling of pressing into territory that is unknown. You know, you don't have a map in advance. The map starts basically totally blank. And not only is the map totally blank, but there are huge chunks of the map that are locked with this sort of like padlock looking thing on them. They're like sealed sections of the map. And as you progress into those areas of the map, um, even if you're, you know, when you're not in those areas, exploring the map colors it in. Basically you come into a room and that room appears on your map and you can see the exits and see where you are in relation to everything else. Um, But if you proceed into one of these areas, that's got the kind of locked um, plate on the map, you have to find uh, I forget what it calls them. These like beacon things within map, that map. Dis- it's a map disruptor. Disruptor. Thank you. Which also kind um, of breaks the like the third wall of this game too. Is that there's a there's an item in there that's straight up called map disruptor. Which why would that exist? It's it's like for the player. This thing is disrupting your map. Uh, I don't I care how how silly that is because it's yeah. a it's a really wonderful mechanical yeah. element of the game because that feeling of proceeding into areas that are um you know unknown that you can't see that even if you are building up the map you might you know you might feel like how do I even find my way back how do I how does yeah. where I am connect to other places I might have been um that's an incredible feeling and that sort of desperate hunt for the map beacon when you're in those areas uh, and the relief of finding it is such a huge part of the like fun of the exploration of this game. Um, uh, not again to compare back to Hollow Knight, but like this is something that I first saw with Hollow Knight. That feeling of this like going into these dark areas on the map and needing to turn them on. Um, and and this game does it really well too. And it's just it's just an incredible mechanic that I, I love to yeah. see. I think there are versions of that that are in other games. Um, sure, yeah. You know, like the the towers in Assassin's Creed or the towers in, in Breath, of the Wild. Breath of the Wild or the towers in like every other game that does this. Um, but there is something uh, that it just feels a little more dangerous being in these areas when you don't know, um, you know, in those open world games, you can just kind of like, look back and look around you and kind of know where you came from and where you were going. Um, mm-hmm. But these, 
tight caverns with four or five exits to every room, it's super easy to get lost very quickly and feel completely um, like unbound to even what your objective is mm -hmm. in the game, uh, which is unclear for the majority of the game, what you're actually trying to do. And yeah, I, I agree. Like finding that map disruptor was very, very critical because then you at least know, like, if I die, I know kind of where I was and I know how to get back to here. And I can see all of those doors that I didn't go through that got me here. But if you just die in the middle of an area where you did not find the map disruptor, it's like, well, I have no idea where the hell I was. And I have no idea really how to get back there because it was like, four lefts three rights up yeah ten, you and know. there's the push and pull of like do I, I i'm low on health do i press on try to kill a few scrub enemies maybe heal myself and continue exploring or do i double back is this too dangerous am i here too soon you know you've got yeah. that like that that tension also there's no markers on the map to start which i thought was yeah. also really cool like it really leaves you feeling like you know, in a in a world that you can't comprehend or or right. or it feels or, or like really such an map. achievement when you get to figure out where the save points are on the map for the first time. Yes, like, yeah. yeah, like there's a there you you have to you have to find you have to unlock map markers and each kind of map marker you have to unlock independently of one another. Like you can unlock the thing to show where the save points are on the map, but later on you have to unmap to uh, mark a you know, find a different thing in order to unlock marking where the merchants are for example or where the other npcs yeah. are and other stuff like that you get that stuff eventually but for a long time you just have to have to learn to read the map and remember where things were and that's tricky but it, it was really cool yeah i wander in the direction because you're me and you do not remember where things are ever <laughs> same this is definitely like this is the same with a lot of the games like this but like i i i can't begin to count the amount of times I hit that map button. I mean, I, I'm looking at that map like every room I enter. Like, all right, where am I? Where am I trying to go? You know, did I, I okay, I fall down here, then wall jump up there, and then go here and go there. Like, it was, uh, I'm frequently staring into that map, but it's a good map. Um, I, I think similarly to how good the the map is and and how good the exploration is um i thought that the uh mechanisms for traversal were really really fun and satisfying i think like just the gravity of the jump was a good it's a good platforming jump and then um it has the type of wall jumping that allows you to uh, like a lot of games, you have like one wall jump. You know, you can jump, you can stick once, and you can jump off, and and that's it. This you can just do it uh, infinite, and you can go up. Like you have full control while you're in the air. You know, like uh, mm -hmm. it's like a Mario. You know, you can jump up and go left and go right, full control. So essentially, you can wall jump up forever. Um, you can just climb walls indefinitely, and that allows yeah. this. This yeah, this it gives this game like an interesting verticality to it as well, where exploration isn't just left to right. It can be left right or really far up. There are some really cool parts of the map that have you like wall climbing really really high, and then uh, classic Metroidvania, you're unlocking new things that allow you to go to new areas, and uh, like some games, it'll be like. A cool new punch that lets you punch the thing that you couldn't punch before and while there's like wow, one of those, now i've got a green punch i wonder if yeah. this can punch through the green wall right this is like okay now you have an infinite grappling hook that will go across the full length of the screen and whip you across or mm -hmm. now you have like a blink you know like a teleport or now you can turn also into not a afraid to put some things that you kind of think of as basics really far in you don't get a double yeah. jump in this game until pretty late in its its uh uh process it's yeah. like one of the last two or three abilities i got and you get electromagnetism which lets you jump as high as you want infinitely very early so yeah yeah that the like yeah. wall climb thing that the comes really climb. early 
And yeah. it's a it's a really yeah. strange order to some of the powers, and that's good because like sometimes this can feel a little rote. You know, there there are powers in this that I think are are pretty unique, but most of them are things that you'll have seen in other Metroidvanias yeah. or similar platformers. But like it does feel like it doles them out in a way that felt a little bit fresh. Um, yeah. And so I, I really liked that, especially that it held some of those things that are like usually like, you know, here's the double jump in you know, like level one or whatever. It held yeah. that for the end. And that was really interesting because you kept seeing places where like, God, if I could only jump a little higher, just a little higher right here. And right. then suddenly when you get that, then, you know, you've got 50 different places to go jump. And that was very exciting. Well, and I just like that, um, you know, this game calls itself an exploration game. And yeah, all of the additional powers, except for maybe one, um, is about making you able to travel in new and interesting ways. And your actual like combat abilities don't really change as far as like how you attack an enemy Uh, from beginning to end. You're, you know, at least my play style was almost exclusively just trying to hit the thing with your sword, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and as much as possible. And there may be some changes, some small changes, using a thing that we'll talk about in a little bit, but like for the most part, this game is all about becoming more agile and becoming able to traverse the map in, in a different way and then utilizing those movement me- uh, mechanics in fights later, but still it's not super significant. Um, and I just, I thought that was really nice and it it got like, for me, a lot of these games, when you have to go back and you're going left and right, and you're going, like Laura was saying, before you go into the same place uh, over and over, if all you can really do is walk or oh, maybe yeah. now you can double jump or whatever, it gets super boring. But these travel mechanisms like were kind of fun to like, mm-hmm. oh, now I can go back to this area and I can whip across it with my uh, hook, my you know eternal hook shot. Um, like it was more fun and I, I I really enjoyed that. Uh let's talk a little bit about the bosses. I think um if I have any real complaint about the game, it's that I I do feel like the bosses were a little on the easy side. Um they're all this sort of like small room single screen style. At least I mean Nate's fought a few more of them than I have, but all of the ones that I have gotten to in my playthrough up to now um have been pretty easy. That's not to say that I think it's like necessarily a problem. Uh, they didn't really block my forward momentum in the game very much, and that's kind of nice. Uh, you They're know, fought them maybe four or five times, and 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 then move on. Um, but I also didn't feel like they were like especially surprising or scary or or mechanically yeah. interesting. So like, oh, I thought they were fine. Um, but I did I laugh know. a lot at some of them. Like one of the bosses is a like tire pipe with a bow on it. That seems to yeah. be the mother of tires. Like, sure. There's a there's a good car battery one that you fight. There's like a like a like a saw, like a table saw sort of thing. Um, yeah, it, it really doesn't change from one like boss one to final boss. That said, the final boss um, was to me at least a con- a pretty considerable step up in in challenge which is fair it's the last one you don't want it to be a pushover um there were a few that were kind of challenging for me there were two that i did manage to kill on the very first time encountering them um but most of them you could beat five you know three to ten attempts i felt like i could get through them because it's until the final boss and maybe a couple of the other optional ones, everything is patterned. So it's just figure out the pattern. It's all about avoidance. Don't stand it's going to be yeah. on yeah. fire in a second and you'll be yeah. fine. Use your travel mechanisms to avoid the attack that it's going to basically tell you what it's about to do. Cause a lot of them have some sort of visual cue about what they're going to do. Avoid it, hit it a couple times, there's almost always like another stage, which is just like manic mode of the boss gets a little more complicated and then it's done. Um, yeah, I, you know, I think these games have to have bosses um, and I'm glad that they were there. But yeah, it was not the uh, the whole I mean, frankly, the all of the combat in this game was like the least interesting part of this game for me. And and that might 
I don't know if that's necessarily what they were going for, but I also kind of thought that was fine. You know, I love a, a yeah. more challenging game, like a you know, but I, I have to imagine this was an intentional choice to make the combat a little more um passive, a little more calmer, just make the game more accessible than uh some of its you know counterparts, which yeah, difficulty is like also part of what they're going for. The main way that you do upgrades in this game, at least related to the the combat, is this chips system. Um, again, not to do too fine a point on it, but very similar to the badges in Hollow Knight. But the the big thing that stood out here was that there's not that many of them. There's there's you know something like forty or something, but you know there's there's not a ton of them, and um, none of them stood out to me as weird. Um, they were all pretty much like this one gives you a 10% chance to do extra damage. This one lets you hit slightly faster. This one lets you use your powers more often, that kind of thing. Pretty much basics. And I didn't see any places where they had like interesting synergies between them. That's something that I could have hoped for too. Um, one of my favorite things in games like this is if they, if they have those upgrades and you realize, Hey, if I use these two weird upgrades together, suddenly I get an an amazing effect. That's really cool to see. And that doesn't really have that exactly. Which is another way I think that the game is kind of telling you that like, yeah, the combat is like it's here and it's decent, but it's not the main focus. Yeah, I would have liked some way to make you feel a little bit more like more noticeably powerful by the end. Um, You know, I, I by the end, you can install like I think I had six or seven of these chips installed. And even with that, when I'm going back to the areas that you know you start the game in it still took me like roughly the same amount of hits to kill the 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 same bad guys that it took me to kill like out of the gates and while i again i think that was intentional it would have been nice to at least feel some like you know growth and strength in the character because they're all adding these improvements that are kind of on the margins and nothing that is going to revolutionize your game style or anything like that that said you're not like this is a baby level for baby yeah there's none of that um i do love baby levels for babies Um, i mean always there was an achievement that told me that i got half the chips so i could be missing some like you know really powerful i only got half of them um so it could be missing something something that made you you know had a more noticeable difference um but for the most part i i rolled with you know the increase like yeah a, a chance to crit a 10% chance to crit and like slightly in, increases the the rate at which you swing your sword, but yeah, not the same, not super noticeable. Um, yeah. So um, there were, there's like two sets. There's either, I think like sort of like defensive exploration style chips and then offensive weapon chips. And, you know, I don't know. I didn't really feel the need to like, optimize at any point like switch them around for different bosses or anything like that um maybe there's a way to do that if you end up with all the chips uh but it it never felt like that i was compelled or needed to do that to progress yeah it didn't quite feel like something you were going to get like a huge sudden benefit out of trying a new build or something yeah um all things considered though like i'm really glad we gave this game a try and uh, nate thank you for picking it off of the list Uh, Yeah, I mean, I feel like I could talk for like two more hours. I I loved this game. Like, I, you know, I think that there it's not perfect. um, And probably some of the reason I love it is because it is incredibly reminiscent of one of my favorite games of all time. But even on its own, I think if you've never played Hollow Knight because it feels, um, I don't know, like the the ref the connections to Dark Souls, the like the, me, the it, I don't have time. <laughs> yeah, the thirty hour element of Dark or of Hollow Knight, like there's a lot of barriers to entry for Hollow Knight um, that I think are fair and real. And the only reason I played Hollow Knight is because I was on uh, paternity leave and I was up until like five in the morning every night and needed something to do. So I played Hollow Knight. Otherwise, I probably never would have picked it up. Um, so if you've always wanted to play Hollow Knight, but for whatever reason have not picked it up, I, I think this is a really good game to play. And then even if Hollow Knight sounds terrible to you, like give this a shot because I think it emphasizes some things a little bit differently 
and is a good game on its own that I would have enjoyed had I never played Hollow Knight. And I, I mean, Laura, you had never played Hollow Knight and you're saying you enjoyed it. Yeah, I enjoyed it very much. And honestly, this game has charm for days. I mean, yeah, it's the cute. It's funny. Like, um, everything that could be a robot is a robot. Um, I love the robotification. I love the, the pixel animations are, um, very amusing. They have a lot, like, uh, I've mentioned the tire boss. There are tires that will just bounce forever. And if you hit them, they reverb, they bounce and they bounce back twice as hard. Like I've seen that before in animations, but it's much funnier with an evil tire. Yeah. Um, and getting killed by those things kind of felt comparable to being killed by like a Goomba in Mario where you're like, oh, yeah. damn it. I should like, I should know better. I should have known. And yet I'm dead. And so here I am dead. Um, uh, and honestly, like if I if I feel that way about a a death, I think that that's one of weirdly my favorite things in video games is like when I get killed by something. It's it's not unfair. Yeah. I was just dumb, and I hit a tire, and it bounced back in my face. Like, of course. Like, and the healing uh, is so easy in this game. Mm-hmm. Like, you basically, if you can stand still and not get hit for about three seconds you can heal yourself for one point um yeah so. we didn't we didn't talk about the healing i actually thought this was a really smart part of this game um mm-hmm. especially if you have this was maybe the most impactful chip install the one that like i got immediately and left on which is quick repair which makes it go even faster um, but mm-hmm. i thought it was a i thought it was a very interesting balance so um every time you kill an enemy you are picking up what are called spare parts which I think is really funny to kill something and then pick up its parts and call them spare parts. You know, it's like, yeah, it's it's like, you know, I, I, they weren't spare to him. Yeah. They were not spare parts. (laughs) That was his legs, you know? Um, but anyway, they're spare parts now because you've killed the thing, but, um, everything you kill drops spare parts, uh, between like two to 30 or 40, depending on the challenge of the, of the enemy. And, those spare parts are also the currency in the game. And so you, and every time you repair, you are giving up, um, I think it's nine, unless you have the chip that I was talking about. And then every time you die, you lose half of your spare parts. Uh, there's a chip that'll modify that, but still. So you're you're both collecting them pretty constantly, but also burning through them pretty constantly. And there's this there is this balance too of like the exploration part where it's like if i'm full health and i have a whole bunch of spare parts i'm i feel like i can go anywhere and do whatever i want but if i'm out of parts then exploration becomes increasingly stressful because it's like when i would maybe normally avoid that enemy i now have to kill it in order to collect its now spare parts and uh you know heal myself and I, I don't know. I thought that was a that was a fun balance. And there's a there's a banking system that allows you to basically deposit your spare parts. The most nervous I got was when I was running around like f- cash in my pockets, rich yeah. money bags, and I'm like, and I, and I accidentally ran into a boss, and I was like, no, oh, no. no. <laughs> yeah, I was like yeah. I'm gonna lose all my money, <laughs> and I did, because um, you lose half or like a huge amount. They do a really smart thing though, and it's just straight up a quality of life thing. And I appreciated it though, is that there the um vendors are sporadic and these like banks are sporadic. They're rarely in the same area. Um, but whatever you put into the bank, you can automatically spend at whatever m- vendor or merchant you're at, wherever they are. So you don't have to do this sort of like go to the bank, make a withdrawal, go into the vendor and and spend it. All you really have to do is when you've got those fat stacks, when your pockets are full of spare parts, if you can just get to one of the banks, then you can deposit it all and it's safe and you don't have to worry about losing it. Nate, Nate, stop explaining cryptocurrency to our listeners. (laughs) (laughs) We've had complaints about this before. And that's why you want to get a cold wallet that is disconnected <laughs> from everything and you 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 put your passphrase on a piece of paper and you swallow it 
Um, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I thought that was unique because you know it's using currency both as a uh, as a currency, but also your means of healing. Um, and I thought it was a good balance and and sort of an interesting mechanic. Yeah. Any last thoughts on Haiku the robot? I will say I'm looking for even though I'm you know playing this. Uh, already i'm kind of looking forward to this finding a new audience on switch when it comes to switch Mm -hmm. i remember how big of a of a hit um you know the uh, met um, hollow knight was it had been out for a long time at that point in early access on uh on steam but then it really found its audience when it hit switch and i hope that this game does the same Uh, i think it deserves it too i think it will uh will find at least an audience um a a bigger audience when it starts coming to to mainstream platforms. Um, not that Steam isn't mainstream, but you know what I mean. Things like Switch and, and other other consoles. Um, yeah. Uh, so yeah, uh, this is available currently just on Steam. It's on it's a Steam for Mac and PC, which is convenient if you have one of those. Yeah, check this game out. I think it's great. Yeah. So do we have a little time for what's making us happy this week? Let's do it. Yes, Laura. What's making you happy this week? Uh, well. Fellas, would you like a highbrow or a lowbrow pick? Because I got one of each. Oh, you know me. I like the lowbrow. Okay. Um, lowbrow is the uh, HBO Max reality show, F-Boy Island. Um, uh, this has been, like, just running through work, um, like, mad. Like, someone at work started watching it and was tweeting about it, live tweeting it while they were packing. Um, she's got, like five or six people watching it. Um, so the premise of this uh, group dating show, like Love Island or, you know, Bachelorette or something, is that there are three women and uh, go to an island with 24 men. Um, the, half of them are secretly nice guys and half of them are F boys and you don't know which is which. And then they have to like, um, at the end of the show, if you decide you're going to end up with a, dude, if it's a nice guy, you split the money 50-50. And if you choose an F-boy, they have the choice whether or not to split the money with you or take all the money for themselves. So things that make the show absolutely hilarious. It's both an excellent reality dating show and making fun of them actually at the same time. So like at times it feels like a 30 Rock episode or like Burning Love, that Comedy Central show. The women have all the power but also the men might be messing with them. And also the show is actively messing with the men. Like (laughs) this is a show where they like, when you get kicked off, if you're a nice guy, you go to the nice going grotto where they put you in a nice house and you drink mimosas and you get like to chill with your bros. And if you were coming on as an F boy and you get kicked off, you go to basically an outdoor like boot camp area called Limbro where Nikki Glaser then goes and tries to reform you by doing things like having a consent coyote hand puppet, try to teach you things, or like, you know, give you one-on-one group therapy sessions. Um, It's it's just very funny. Um, Like the show knows that it's, it knows what it is. Um, there was a part where two people went on a date and it literally just showed black and said, this date was too boring to show. So we're going to show you abs instead. And then just showed a montage of abs. And I was like, (laughs) thank you for watching F boy Island. And I was like, honestly, yes, this is, um, if you must partake in reality shows, having one that knows it's dumb is way preferable to me than something like the bachelorette when it's like, everyone's in love. The show is like, yeah, you know, um, and then the second season gets even more meta um, because it starts bringing back people from season one. Um, it gets very strange. Um, I don't know. It's it's very rare that like these shows often have a comedian for a host and then don't let them do anything. But in this case, like Nikki Glazer um, did a session called Truth or Burn, where she asked guys questions. And if they didn't answer, they had to eat successively hotter peppers until they started <laughs> crying. I was like, make the bad boys cry. <laughs> so <I'm> like, what? <laughs> nice. It's great. It's super. You already know if you're watching the show, you have clicked add to HBO Max if you want to watch it. But um, it's one of the 
best smart dumb shows I've seen in a while. That sounds like fun. I was actually going to recommend a uh, a streaming show as well, although I haven't watched enough of it to give like a really full throated recommendation. But I will just say that I I, I just started the uh, the new Netflix Sandman adaptation. Ooh, um, and it's actually good. I think. Okay. I, I've only seen the first two episodes so far, so I can't like categorically say yes or no. But like I'd always thought of that as like an unadaptable property. And there are parts of it that I think probably still are unadaptable. Like it, it, it starts off with a bit of a plot and then kind of goes into, I, if I remember the comics well, which, you know, it's been years since I've read them. Like I remember them kind of going in trippier and trippier directions and becoming more and more of an anthology. Um, but at least at the beginning, it is the story. If you, if you haven't read the Sandman, which, you know, maybe you weren't obsessively reading the, you know, weird output of the DC vertigo in uh, imprint back in the nineties. Um, the Sandman uh, actually the Sandman originally was this week, a uh, DC character that was, I think basically like a, like a detective type of character who like, like put people to sleep with sleeping gas. And um, at some point DC was like, we want to revive that character sort of, but they handed it over to Neil Gaiman. Um, and they told him like, they get, let him do whatever he wanted. He just had to make a new Sandman that wasn't the same as the old Sandman. And so what did he do? His Sandman is uh, like a, a a sort of god of sleep, the the lord of the world of dreams, uh, you know, personified by a, the, 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 the like sketchy illustration of a goth boy that, that uh, Neil Gaiman wished he looked like back then. Um, he's like... <laughs> you know, a, a, a wiry black haired, um, you know, British twink, uh, who, uh, in the first episode spends almost the entire first episode imprisoned nude in a glass orb. Um, it's real weird and campy, but it's a, it's a great, uh, they were great comics and I thought they would be a weird adaptation, but like it works. I think it's a, I think it's working pretty well. Um, casting is really good. Uh, the the you know, the the wiry black haired British guy they got for the lead he looks just like the weird nineties sketches, um, and the uh, the whole thing just like looks expensive. It's like a well done show. Lots of like sh- very CGI shots of the land of dreams, full of like flying dragon gargoyles and you know impossible architecture and stuff. But also kind of grounded in, in that like. Um, you know, the, the beginning of the story is Morpheus, AKA the Sandman, the Lord of dreams has been imprisoned, uh, and spends a long time imprisoned. I won't give you the details there cause it was really fun. Um, that whole chunk that's basically the first episode, but when he finally escapes, he's lost a great deal of his power and his, his lordly vestments, the things that, that, that he had invested a lot of power in things like his helm and he has to get them back before he can restore himself to his full power and restore his kingdom. And so that means a lot of like the Lord of dreams trying to like bully uh, art uh, collectors to get his crap back, that kind of thing. Um, It's, it's really pretty good so far. I'm looking forward to watching more of it. Apparently this show adapts like the first two volumes of the comic, Mm -hmm. um, which I think is, is a good chunk. And um, I, I, I mean, I can't full throatedly recommend it yet. Like I said, I've only watched the first two episodes, but I'm excited. So, I mean, um, it's a it. '90s comic, so the volumes are dense. It's not like some of the uh, more modern day ones where a volume is like half an episode of a TV show. Oh yeah, and have you seen Neil Gaiman comics? Like he packs those text boxes in. Man, it's oh. uh, <laughs> he 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 draws a circle and then he writes real small in it. <laughs> it's amazing there's enough room for the great art in Sandman because there's so yeah. many words. I mean, I do yeah. love Sandman. This is not a rip against one of the, you know, objectively one of the best series that, you know, will stand the test of time. However, there's so many words. <laughs> it is. It is real wordy. Uh, it, it works well as a show. Uh, mm-hmm. Nate, what's making you happy? Well, I haven't been on the show for a couple of weeks, so my, my thing is a little dated, but I... I still feel like I have to talk about it. Um, so uh, one of my favorite games, uh, a little game called Into the Breach. Uh, you may or may not know about it. Uh, oh, yes. By developer Subset Games. Uh, Into the Breach came out 
four years ago, a little over four years ago, February of 2018. And uh, uh, three weeks ago, maybe a month ago, they they did what they also did for FTL, which is release an entirely free uh, expansion for the game. It's called Advanced Edition. So now there's Into the Breach Advanced Edition. And it basically takes Into the Breach and adds more of everything. And unlike FTL, all of the new features that they added with in, Into the Breach, you have the ability to toggle individual things on. Do you want the new missions? Do you want the new bad guys? Do you want the new uh, mechs? You know, it's a lot more customizable. Um, but it basically, you know, resulted until we started playing this game, uh, when I had time to play games, yeah, I was fully back into, into the breach, which I have not really played for several years. Um, and it's great. And the new additions are fantastic. Uh, I somehow lost my save file for my original into the breach no. uh, game, which is very disappointing. Cause I had a lot of time and uh, of hours, uh, right? yeah and personal accomplishments in that game including a perfect run on hard mode but you know whatever it's in the past i know that i did it and that's all that really matters but the data to back it up is gone um but anyway so there's so, no yeah. proof and so i don't believe you anymore either that's fair but you know what i don't need i did that for me okay <laughs> i didn't do it for anyone else so that's good, Nate. That's really healthy. <laughs> but uh, I, I really bring this up because I, I just think it's so incredible. Subset is a small team. I think it's two people. I'm sure there's some supporting uh, members of the of, of the group, especially for how successful they've been. But it's really centered around just a couple of people. And now with their two games, which have both been massive hits, they have released 100 percent free expansions to those games that. They're at this point releasing to like diehard fans that would absolutely pay whatever they put, whatever yeah. the ticket price was. Any of us would have paid for this expansion to Into the Breach. Um, but instead, they just layer on. It, it, it refreshes the game, makes it uh, interesting and new and challenging in a lot of different ways. They added a new mode called unfair mode, which is funny. <laughs> um, I have not tried it yet, uh, but I intend to. Um, but it, it's great. And I just I really, you know, in a um, I don't not to get all like preachy about it because, you know, developers deserve to make money and they need to make money. But like that, just that the act of four years later, putting out a full on expansion to your hit game entirely for free just like does not exist in the in this market and i think that's uh you know worth praise and uh you know i recommend if you liked the game 4 years ago check it out now because it's only more better than it was before yeah and um i mean i'm i'm sure you already spotted this too Nate but like they this came out this this expansion came out alongside their mobile release yeah, for uh, for the game, which launched as part of Netflix's new games uh, service model thing, um, which has actually been really interesting. And I think a surprising number of people have like not noticed or been informed of Netflix's launch of this thing because because it's not like its own thing. It's just like part of your existing Netflix subscription. I don't think they've been pushing hard on marketing it. Um, it's yeah. easy to miss. But like um, if you uh, if you haven't checked out Into the Breach and you have a Netflix account, you can download the iPad, iPhone, or Android version for free. And it includes all of the expansion content that Nate was just talking about. And it's apparently like a really, really well done mobile port. All the things I was reading about it said people were like, were like flipping out about it being a good mobile port. When I played Into the Breach, uh, I at the time thought like, hey, this would have been really great on the iPad. Um, apparently they did too. But it's also apparently worked really well on phone. They've come up with like a good mobile interface for it, yeah. touch screen interface. So like great time to check out that game if you haven't. Well, and you know, I'll say of course, like I'm sure they were paid a fair amount by Netflix to oh yeah, um, to link this together. So I I don't, you yeah. know, there was still like money transacted in this, but like that's what they did with FTL though, too, where uh they yeah. paired No, they and they didn't need to like 
make that huge expansion to get Netflix money. And also they didn't need yeah. to release that expansion for everyone. They could have charged, you know, you Nate on your steam account for that rather than just including it. But right. like incredible. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think it's, it's really, it's really fantastic. And, uh, we, we talked, I don't, I guess we, have we talked about the Netflix stuff on this episode or on this show? Because we almost did an episode where really, we talked about really, doing we, one on, yeah. on point P, which was, uh, you know, my first introduction to the Netflix games. And, uh, yeah, I thought, I mean, I, I, it's hard to support any major, you know, conglomerate just absorbing more and more content and more and more, uh, capital. But so far, like the Netflix thing seems to be fine and, uh, you know, they're not as predatory yet as some of these things you know, turn out. Yeah, the list of games is pretty long. Not all of them are like things I'm like, wow, I can't wait to check that out. But there are some really, really good stuff on there. Into the Breach, obviously, but like, um, and Point P is, uh, in, in case you haven't heard about it, is the newest game from the creator of Downwell. It's a very similar arcadey kind of game. Shane absolutely fell in love with it. I thought it was a little. I feel like we talked about it in one of the making. Yeah, I think Shane segments. made it. Maybe made it's it in making yeah. us happy yeah. or something. I think so. Um, and there were some others. What was it? Um. We did an episode a while back on um, Before Your Eyes, which was that yes. game that you play as a narrative game that, that uses a webcam to monitor your eyes for blinking. And it was an incredible right. and honestly pretty emotional experience. And at the time, I thought like, you know, not everybody has a good webcam on their computer. Um, maybe this would actually work better for folks on phones. And apparently they made it work on phones. It's uh, So you can play that on your phone now. I think that'll be actually a really good way to play that game. And they've got like two dozen games. Just scrolling through like Moonlighter is a, I haven't played it personally, but it's like a, a action roguelike kind of thing with shopkeeping elements that I've heard really good things about. There's a bunch of Stranger Things games. There's some kind of exploding kittens thing. There's... Uh, some there's asphalt some money games. Behind this. <laughs> yeah, there's some money behind this. Like, not everything on here is something I'm like already familiar with, but like I and I you know, I know they're gonna put their like there's Stranger Things games on here. They're gonna there's there's gonna be some kind of uh uh you know uh, Queen's Gambit chess game, that kind of thing. <laughs> uh, but they're apparently also going after uh indies, which when I heard that Netflix was doing this, I was not expecting them to just like get good mobile ports of good indies that hadn't had mobile ports. And that's actually a pretty interesting strategy. So, well, they might have learned, uh, you know, I'd say both Nintendo and Sony, um, you know, really grabbed some some market when they opened up their platforms to indie games a little bit more. You know, for a little while, the mm-hmm. PlayStation Four was like where you would play indie games if you didn't have a PC, and then the Switch has really taken that now at this point. Um, and so maybe Netflix saw that and and is trying to embrace that a little bit. Hopefully they just, you know, it doesn't become uh, I the 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 Netflix approach to like content creators and how they pay them is it's I, I guess it it's great for some and horrible for some others. Um, yeah. um you know, I'm always wary of anything like that, but at least so far it seems okay. Yeah, and like anything with Netflix, there is absolutely no information in this space about how they are paying people. So yeah, they keep all that stuff really close to the vest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I read a thing; even they don't even tell their own showrunners and creators how their shows are doing mm-hmm. because they don't want to be they don't want to be in a position where like somebody can come to them and say like, "Hey, my show is a hit. You need to pay me more next season." So they yeah. because they're the only ones that know how the shows are doing, they just don't say. So yeah, screw you. Yeah, Yeah, that feels bad. (laughs) Yeah, I don't know what they're doing with that in regards to games, but like, I hope they're treating these people fairly and giving them. Well, they throw a lot of money at people who would not have maybe had access to that money in the first place, but they cap the uh, earnings for a lot of people on on things that like you know become mega hits where it would have also resulted in that person becoming uh you know financially wealthy and instead they're not because they signed some you know contract with with netflix so i don't know i mean it's it's complicated um obviously well thank you for joining us on this episode of the short game (laughs) you can find our show on the internet at www.theshortgame.net You'll find all of our links there. If you want to support the show, 
and we hope that you do, you can find us on Patreon at patreon.com slash the short game. And if you support us on Patreon, you'll immediately get access to our Discord. That's where we talk about the show. We plan episodes there. We chit chat about games as we're playing them. And we also just chat about whatever. Uh, it's a great place to hang if you want one of those on the internet. Um, we also have uh, short game stickers for anybody who backs at the $5 a month level. Uh, let me know if you do so I can make sure I get those out to you. And let's see. Um, you can find our show on uh, on Twitter at underscore short game or you can find me on twitter at reagan k that's r-a-y-g-a-n-k uh laura where can people find you on twitter at laura j nash and nate where can people find you on the discord rambling my like half baked thoughts about netflix and how it treats uh content creators and also on twitter at nate stl and listeners once again thank you so much for joining us on this episode of the short game